as I mentioned in the welcome, today is our annual Ubuntu Sunday. And Ubuntu, for those of you who are new to New Hope or maybe uh, haven't heard yet, is our group that uh, supports some development and relief work in Malawi. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. There are many things that strike me about what uh, Claude Nikondea says. The reality of Jesus creating space for people to encounter the kingdom of God and make better choices, and the truth that salvation is not just about heaven or about a personal relationship, but about transforming households, communities, countries, and continents were very uh, powerful ideas for me, and ones I think that we can all agree with and affirm. Two weeks ago, we had a visit from Nancy Hinga from Malawi, and she shared with us a little bit about the, story, the work of transformation that's being done in Kamenzi, where we partner, and beyond there as well in the rest of Malawi. And today I want to continue talking about transformation and about being the light. And I'm going to do that through some stories that we're going to listen to together. The first is a story in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. This takes place during the time of the prophet Elisha. And when I heard the story of Agnes from Malawi, which I'm going to tell later, I was reminded of this story. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, Go around and ask your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jar jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Now, Agnes is a woman from a village in Malawi, and unfortunately, I don't have a picture of her. But she's been able to participate in the small animal project of CRWRC World Renew. So she received a goat, and through the income she's been able to generate from her goats and chickens, she paid for secondary uh, education for her daughter. So she sent her daughter to high school and paid for her fees. And now her daughter is studying in the university, and she's studying agriculture. She's the first girl from her region to go to university. And this all came about because Agnes received a goat. And um, I think that's pretty amazing. So now she's passed on her goat, the first offspring of her goat, to another family. And they've done the same and so on, and so on. So this has the potential to increase and really bring transformation to the whole community. So these stories of the widow with her oil and Agnes with her goat are stories of transformation and provision beginning with a very small thing. A chicken, a goat, a small jar of olive oil leading to life for a family and hope for a community. Jesus says in Luke 4, verses 18 and 19, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came to the poor, 
the prisoner, the blind, and the oppressed, to bring freedom, good news, and light, and sight. Henry Nouwen writes, um, or wrote, the church is the people of God. The Latin word for church, ecclesia, comes from the Greek ek, which means out, and kaleo, which means to call. The church is the people of God, called out of slavery to freedom, out of sin to salvation, despair to hope, darkness to light, an existence centering on death to an existence focused on light. When we think of church, we have to think of a body of people traveling together. We have to envision women, men, and children of all ages, races, and societies supporting one another on their long and often tiresome journey to their final home. We are the church, and we are called to freedom, salvation, hope, light, and life. And we are called to support one another in this journey. Not just those of us gathered here, all that's a good place to begin, but also those of all ages, races, and societies. We are part of the universal church, the church that goes beyond congregations, beyond denominations, beyond cities and countries. And part of the church that we, as New Hope Church, have chosen to journey with is in Malawi. You may also have chosen personally to travel with parts of the church in other places, maybe in South America or Asia or downtown Calgary or the east side of Vancouver. So this morning, I want to ask you to think about where is the bigger story for you? The story that engages with those who are poor, blind, oppressed, prisoners. How do we engage those stories while preserving the dignity and respecting the equality of the poor? I think that's a very important question for us who typically are not poor. Oscar Romero was the Archbishop of San Salvador from 1977 to 1980 when he was martyred, and he's one of my personal heroes. He was martyred for standing in solidarity with the poor and speaking out against the oppression and violence of uh, the government of El Salvador and the ruling class. And I love what he writes about um, helping the poor. He says, or said, we should not feel superior when we help anyone. Those who give materially receive spiritually. There is an exchange of property that is understood only in a true spirit of poverty, which makes the rich feel they are close brothers and sisters of the poor, and makes the poor feel they are equal givers and not inferior to the rich. The giving is mutual. So transformation and development is not about us as rich, successful, and productive people fixing what is broken in other places. It's about attending to what already has potential for growth and nurturing that. And it's also about recognizing our own poverty. Maybe our poverty isn't material, but we do have poverty in our society and culture, and some in our culture do experience material poverty as well. So it's recognizing our own poverty and letting Jesus transform us. And it's recognizing that when we help, we do so as equals. Nancy shared about how they're using the story of Lazarus in John 11 to help communities in Malawi begin uh, the process of transformation. So we're going to listen uh, to that story now too. In John 11, starting at verse 38, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad order, 
for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. The communities that listen to this story are invited to think about these questions. What is dead in our community that needs to be brought to life? What are the stones that Jesus is inviting me to roll away? And what are the grave clothes that need to be removed? Nancy told me this story as we were sitting over a meal together, and it really, it really hit me. Personally, I thought, wow, those are pretty good questions for anybody to ask, not just a community in Malawi. So I began to think about those questions. What is dead in me that needs to be raised to life? What are the stones that Jesus is inviting me to roll away? What are the grave clothes that need to be removed? And as, as I've reflected on those questions, one answer for me is um, about praying for Malawi. And I'm not sure if that's a stone or something that needs to be brought to life, but, but that's what it is for me. As Nancy and I talked about our lives and her work in Malawi, she shared how dark a place it is. She used to work in South Sudan, and she is saying that Malawi is a dark place spiritually. So you can imagine that it's, it's pretty dark. And she shared that there's a lot of opposition to the people and the programs that have the potential to bring transformation. And we may attribute this to people being set in their ways or just opposed to change. But I believe there's a deeper reason. The enemy of our souls does not want Malawi to experience freedom, sight, and good news. And we don't talk very often from this place in New Hope about evil spiritual forces being at work. But I know that there's an enemy that wants Lazarus to stay dead. And I know that he does everything in his power to keep him in the tomb. But I also know that he is fighting a fight that he has already lost, that Jesus has already won. John 1, 1 to 5 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness has not overcome the light, and it never will. The light is stronger than the dark, and it always will be. But we have a part to play in bringing the light. And a piece of my part is to pray. To pray for the light to grow, to pray for the spirit of truth, to have free reign, to pray that the oppressed will be set free to pray that those who work for the light will be protected and that their work and their lives will bear fruit. The invitation to me personally is not to give more money, but to give more time, to pray for Nancy, to pray for Boniface and Christine and Jane, 
to pray for Hannah and to pray for Malawi. What is dead in you that needs to be raised to life? What are the stones that Jesus is inviting you to roll away? What are the grave clothes that need to be removed? Some of the cultural stones that we might have to roll away, and these apply to me as well, not, um, not just in a general way, in a personal way. Some of the cultural stones that we might have to roll away are complacency, and just not caring. Perhaps there's too much busyness in our lives to really spend time on what I want to value. Compassion might need to be brought to life in me. Consumerism and always feeling like I need or want more may be the grave clothes that need to be removed. And I'm sure there are many others for us to think about. But I do invite you to think about those questions for yourself. World Renew, formerly known as CRWRC, and this is the last time we will say CRWRC, from now on we will refer to World Renew, is involved in development work, in helping communities make the most of the strengths and good things that are already present. They're working to help communities become more self-sufficient like the widow and her olive oil, Elisha began with what she already had in her house, even though she didn't recognize it as an asset. They are doing so, recognizing that it is actually Jesus who brings what is dead alive. The communities have their part to play, and we have our part to play, to roll away the stone and to clear away the grave clothes but it is still Jesus who brings new life. It is still Jesus who brings the dead alive. He chooses to involve us in the process, but it would be useless to roll away the stone and clear away the grave clothes if he wasn't active in bringing new life, in bringing light to the darkness. And this is as true in our own lives as it is for those who don't have enough to eat. Oscar Romero again said, It is not God's will for some to have everything and others to have nothing. That cannot be of God. God's will is that all his children be happy. How is God inviting you to participate in bringing the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven? How can you be part of the bigger story that helps make all God's children happy. Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Let's pray. God, we do pray that we will see the glory of God, that we will see the poor with enough to eat, the oppressed set free, the blind receive their sight, we pray that for ourselves, that you would help us see where we are poor, where we are blind, where oppression influences us and inhibits us. And we pray for that for Malawi, for Kamenzi. that your light will shine and that your life will flourish, that you will bring hope 
where there is despair, life where there is death, salvation where there is sin, freedom where there is bondage. And we pray in Jesus' name. And we pray that you will help us to believe. And that you will help us to be the light Amen.